Hello folks. A few days ago I made a video called Rulers of Evil excerpt and asked the people to vote in the two boxes that I put below the video to vote for whether they want me to read the whole book Rulers of Evil or rather not. And so far I received a lot of very positive responses that of course uh, gave my motivation to read the whole book another push and I'm really looking forward to do it. But before I'm going to read the whole book, I found a little document a friend of mine made some time ago, Walt Sticker from Grand Design Exposed, as kind of a teaser that deals with several quotes from the book and starts uh, first and for all with the whole first chapter of Rulers of Evil. So I want to tease you a little bit to make you excited about things are to come. But you know, for the moment I'm quite busy with a lot of radio shows and, and another project and um, I don't know how long it's going to take me to upload all Rulers of Evil because it has some 350 pages and it's going to be a long read, an exhausting read, but interesting read, I can assure you. Anyway, I started um, today thinking that I should just go there and try to start with the, uh, with the teaser that I'm going to read from you right now. You know, the first chapter from Rulers of Evil is called Subliminal Rome and that already gives an idea what the book is all about. Subliminal Rome. Hidden Rome, the hidden hand, as the Jesuits also call themselves. So when you understand this title, you already get an idea what's it going to be in the future. We start by reading a quote from Bishop Mandel Creighton from his letters. And the quote goes, The Roman Catholic Church is a state. Unquote. So now we go into when a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter announced in his 1992 Time magazine cover story that a conspiracy binding President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II into a, quote, secret, holy alliance, unquote, had brought about the demise of communism, at least one reader saw through the hype. Professor Carol A. Brown from the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts fired off a letter to Times editors saying, quote, Last week I taught my students about the separation of church and state. This week I learned that the Pope is running U.S. foreign policy. No wonder our young people are cynical about American ideals. What Brown had learned from Carl Bernstein I had discovered for myself over several years of private investigation. The papacy really does run the United States foreign policy and always has. Yes, Bernstein noted that the leading American players behind the Reagan-Vatican conspiracy to a man were quote-unquote, devout Roman Catholics, namely, and now listen to a few names, very interesting, William Casey, director of the CIA, Alexander Haig, secretary of state, Richard Allen, national security advisor, Vernon Walters, ambassador at large, Judge William Clark, also a national security advisor, and also William Wilson, ambassador to the Vatican State. But the reporter neglected to mention that the entire Senate Foreign Relations Committee was governed by Roman Catholics as well, specifically, specifically the following senators. Joseph Biden, who is today the Vice President of the United States, and then he was Senator for the Subcommittee on European Affairs. John Kerry, who is today the Secretary of State of the United States of America, today, 2015, and then he was Senator on Terrorism, Narcotics and International Communications. Paul Sabanis, International Economic Policy, Trade, Oceans and Environment. And also Daniel P. Moynihan, Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. And Christopher Dodd from Western Hemisphere and Peace Corps Affairs. Bernstein would have been wandering off point to list the Roman Catholic leaders of American domestic policy, such as Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell and Speaker of the House Tom Foley. In fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no area of federal legislative activity according to the 1992 World Almanac of US politics that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. Well. What are you going to say to that on a so-called protestant country? Completely controlled by Catholics and we are speaking about the World Almanac of US politics of 1992. Continue reading. 
The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve System, commodity, uh, commodity prices, rents services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures, including wage and price controls. Well, what do you need that for <coughs> in a uh, so-called capitalistic society where everything is free and unregulated, right? Ask yourself that. Gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, very important point, nutrition, think of Monsanto, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharine, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped, the aging in or other words, uh, the aging in other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of the Roman Catholic laypersons. Now, who are these? I'm going to read a few names right now. Some of them were, like Frank Annunzio, Edward Kennedy, Daniel Moynihan, Joseph Biden, John Kerry, John Murtha, Silvio Conti, John LaFalci, Mary Rose Oakar, Kika de la Garza, Patrick Leahy, David Obey, John Dingle, Charles Lucan, Claiborne Pell, Christopher Dodd, Edward Madigan, Charles Rangel, Vic Fazio, Edward Markey, Dan Rostenkowski, or Edward Roybel, Joseph McDade, James Florio, Henry Gonzalez, Barbara Mikulski, Thomas Harkin, George Miller, and we probably could even, uh, could even go on with this list here. Now, Vatican Councils II, Constitution of, on the Church of 1964, you know, Vatican Council II, the one that I've spoke about on numerous videos before, that took place between 1962 and 1965, and started the ecumenical movement to get all the apostate churches back under the wings of Rome, this constitution instructs politicians to use their secular offices to advance the cause of Roman Catholicism. Catholic laypersons, quote, whoever they are, are called upon to expend all their energy for the growth of the church and its continuous sanctification, and to make the church present and operative in those places and circumstances where only through them can it become the salt of the earth. Unquote. That's from Article 4 in uh, Chapter 4 in uh, Article 33 in the Constitution. Vatican II further instructs all Catholics, quote, by their competence in secular disciplines and by their activity to vigorously contribute their efforts so that the goods of this world may be more equitably distributed among all men and may in their own way be conducive to universal progress in human and Christian freedom and to remedy the customs and conditions of the world if they are an inducement to sin so that they all may be conformed to the norms of justice and may favor the practice of virtue rather than hinder it. End quote. 
Now, everything that I just read maybe doesn't make any sense to you, but that's probably because you think you are living in a republic or even in a democracy, uh, which both you don't, but you're living probably in communism, because when you analyze this, what I've just read, that is pure communism, using, of course, Jesuitical sophistry and casistry. And that's something we go on later in this paper, <coughs> when uh, uh, y you will see later in this, in this paper when I keep on reading. So, I continue. Vatican II affirms Catholic doctrine dating back to 1302, when Pope Boniface VIII asserted that, quote, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff, unquote. This was the inspiration of the papacy to create the United States of America that materialized in 1776 by a process just as secret as the Reagan Vatican production of Eastern Europe in 1989. What? What are you saying? The American government, Roman Catholic from the beginning? From 1776 on? Well, consider. The land known today as the District of Columbia bore the name Rome in 1663, property records. And the branch of the Potomac River that bordered Rome on the south was called Tiber. This information was reported in the 1902 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on Daniel Carroll. Now, that is another very interesting point that we have here. Probably most of the people have no idea, like I also in the, in the past also had not. There was a big gap, you know, between the discovering of America in 1492 by so-called Christopher Columbus, who so-called discovered that new continent, and then the founding of the nation in 1776. Everything that happened in between is not in any school taught, at least not to my knowledge. And we will go on to that later in, the ch uh, in different chapters of Tapasosi, what is being taught in history classes, if there are any history classes at all. <coughs> Sorry. And this information comes, as he writes here, from the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1902 edition. Very interesting, because when you get an edition today, there are probably no, not the same things an anymore as they have been more than a hundred years ago, because all these have been taken over and they have been cleansed out of a lot of things. But I also read this, uh, that it was mentioned in the Catholic Encyclopedia in an article on Daniel Carroll. Now raise your hands if you know who Daniel Carroll was. Okay, I cannot see what you're doing, but I'm quite sure that not so many hands will be raised. Because who knows Daniel Carroll? Who knows John Carroll? Who knows Charles Carroll? And who knows their role in the founding of the United States of America in 1776? Well, if you want to know that, <coughs> then you have to stay for the whole reading of the book because it is explained in here and it also is explained of course in a lot of other videos that i did but okay i'm gonna keep on reading right now the article specifically declaring itself quote of interest to catholics unquote in the 1902 edition was deleted from the new catholic encyclopedia 1967. Oh, what did i just say <laughs> Take the, uh, take the edition of 1902 and you will probably not find the same thing in newer editions anymore. And he states that just right here. You know, I haven't read this before. Uh, I, I mean, I have read uh, the whole um, first chapter of Rulers of Evil, but I didn't know that anymore. Well, it's, it's, it's quite interesting how they change the things. And that's the way how they change history, because they write history. Okay, continue reading. Other facts were reported in 1902 and deleted from 1967. Interesting that 1967 is just after Vatican Council II, which ended in 1965, isn't it? For example, when Congress met in Washington for the first time in November 1800, quote, the only two really comfortable and imposing houses within the bounds of the city belonged to Roman Catholics. One was Washington's, Washington's first mayor, Robert Brent. The other was Brent's brother-in-law, Notley Young, a Jesuit priest. Daniel Carroll was a Roman Catholic congressman from Maryland who signed two of America's fundamental documents, the Articles of Confederation 
and the United States Constitution. Carroll was a direct descendant from the, uh, of the Calverts, a Catholic family to whom King Charles I of England had granted Maryland as a feudal barony. Carroll had received his education at St. Omer's Jesuit College in Flanders, where young English-speaking Catholics were trained in variety of guerrilla techniques for advancing the cause of Roman Catholicism among hostile Protestants. In 1790, President George Washington, a Protestant, so-called, I do not agree that George Washington was a Protestant, or as Eric John Phelps likes to explain it, a Baptist, and because why do I deny that? Uh, you only have to look up at the uh, at the painting that is done on the ceiling on the Capitol, uh, the apotheosis it is called, and you can see the deification of George Washington. And I do not think that a Protestant would ever be deified. Surely not in a Protestant country, but. That's what we're all talking about right here. Is the United States of America really Protestant? Or are they Catholic from the beginning? And as Tapasosi stated already in the beginning, and I asked that question, Catholic from the beginning? Yeah, you will see that holds stand as farther, as farther, as farther as we go in this book. Again, in 1790, President George Washington, a Protestant, make up your mind for yourself if that is true or not, appointed Congressman Carroll to head a commission of three men to select land for the federal city called for in the Constitution. Of all places, the commission chose Rome, which at the time consi consisted of four farms, one of which belonged to, yeah, you guessed it, Daniel Carroll. It was upon Carroll's farm that the new government chose to erect its most important building, today known to everybody as the Capitol. The American capital abounds with clues of its Roman origins. Freedom, the Roman goddess whose statue crowns the dome, was created in Rome at the studio of American sculptor Thomas Crawford. We find a whole pantheon of Roman deities in the great fresco covering the dome's interior rotunda. Well, that is exactly what I just spoke about. So who do we find in this uh, great fresco of the Pantheon, the Apotheosis, we find in the capital? These persons are Persephone, Sears, Freedom, Vulcan, Mercury, even a deified George Washington, as I explained earlier. These figures were the creation of Vatican artist Constantino Brumidi. And by the way, if you want to see that and get a little bit more explanation of that, I um, advise you to watch the video from uh, Chris Pinto, The Hidden Face of the Founding Fathers. A very interesting video to watch. And there you will see, without any doubt, that George Washington not, surely not was a protestant. But anyway, I continue reading now. The fact that the National State House evolved as a capital bespeaks Roman influence. No building can rightly be called a capital unless it's a temple of Jupiter, the great father god of Rome, who ruled heaven with his thunderbolts and nourished the earth with his fertilizing rains. If it was a Capitolium, it belonged to Jupiter and his priests. Jupiter's mascot was the eagle, uh -huh. which the founding fathers made their mascot as well. A Roman eagle tops the governing idol of the House of Representatives. A 46-inch sterling silver and ebony wand called a mace. The mace is, quote, the symbol of authority in the House, unquote. When the sergeant-at-arms displays it before an unruly member of Congress, the mace restores order. Its position at the rostrum tells whether the House is in committee or in session. America's national motto, Anuit Coptus, came from a prayer to Jupiter. It appears in Book 9 of Virgil's epic propaganda, the Aeneid, a poem commissioned just before the birth of Christ by Caius Machinas, the multi-billionaire power behind Augustus Caesar. The poem's objective was to fashion Rome into an imperial monarchy 
for which its citizens would gladly sacrifice their lives. Fascism may be an ugly word to many, but its stately emblem is apparently offensive to no one. The emblem of fascism, a pair of them, commands the wall above and behind the speaker rostrum in the chambers of the House of Representatives. They are called fascists, and I can think of no reason for them to be there other than to declare the fascist nature of American Republican democracy. Now, just gonna stop here a sec for a second. I will put in the video a picture of that, uh, of these fascists in the House of Representatives. And any any time when you turn on the television and you listen uh, to Obama or whatever puppet is gonna speak there, and it's <laughs> interesting when the Pope comes later this year in 2015 to the United States of America, he will speak there also. You will see the fascists with your own eyes. The problem is that what these fascists, what these symbols mean, is never explained <coughs> to the lay people, to the normal people like you and me. When we do not do our own research of <coughs> what these symbols mean and what they stand for, we have no idea. And this is exactly what, these article, uh, what this article is all about. So, they're called fascists. And I can think of no reason for them to be there other than to declare the fascistic nature of American Republican democracy. Okay, Republican democracy, that's, I would also put their question mark in there. Whenever did the Americans decide to leave the Republican system and go into a democracy? When did the people decide that? Okay, I continue. A fascist is a Roman device. Actually, it originated from the ancient Etruscans, from whom the earliest Romans derived their religious jurisprudence nearly 3,000 years ago. It's an axe hat whose handle is a bundle of rods tightly strapped together by a red sinew. It symbolizes the ordering of priestly functions in a, simple, in a, in a single infallible sovereign, an autocrat, who would require life and limb of his subjects. If the fascist is entwined with laurel, like the pair on the house wall, it signifies Caesarian military power. The Romans called this infallible sovereign Pontifex Maximus, or supreme bridge builder. No Roman was called Pontifex Maximus until the title was given to Julius Caesar in 48 before Christ. Today's Pontifex Maximus is Pope John Paul II at the time of the writing of this. After that we had Pope Benedict, now we have Pope Francis, even a Jesuit. And do you see this now, how they twist the minds of the American people by not telling them those things? An axe hat whose handle is a bundle of rods tightly strapped together by a red sign which symbolizes the ordering of priestly functions? So, what <coughs> do priestly functions have to do in the House of Representatives? What does church have to do with state in a so-called protestant country where church and state are to be separated? What does that have to do in the House of Representatives? If you can answer me that question, I would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Okay, I continue reading. <laughs> this. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny or what, but it, it, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Don't you think so? They put all the symbols and all the meanings right before our face and we have no idea what they mean and we have no idea what they stand for. And that's why we vote for Republicans and Democrats and all the other puppets out there and think that we are free because we, have a f we, we, we think we have a choice. <laughs> There's also a nice picture. When I think of it, I will put that in the video right here. <laughs> the illusion of choice. <laughs> anyway, I continue now. As we shall discover in forthcoming chapters, John Paul II does not hold that title alone. He shares it with a mysterious partner, a military man, a man holding an, ofi uh, an office that has been known for more than four centuries as Papa Nero, the Black Pope. 
I shall present evidence that the house fascists represent the black pope who indeed rules the world. Later I will develop what is sure to become a controversial hypothesis, that the black pope rules by divine appointment and for the ultimate good of mankind. It's not only the Pope who rules, it's the Black Pope who rules the Pope, and that is something that has been that way since 1814. <coughs> and why am I quite sure that it has been that way since 1814? Well, the Jesuit order has been banned by a Pope in 1773, by a papal bull, a paper that can normally not be revised, that normally stands for all eternity. But they gloriously revived in 1814 by another Pope. And how do you think that comes? Why would another Pope allow the Jesuits back in, if not threatened by his life, if not threatened by his position? Well, that's also an interesting question, I guess, isn't it? At least to me it is. But we can discuss this, of course. That's why I'm leaving comments on to this video, and I'm looking forward to your comments, and when they're interesting, I will even go to discuss them with you. Or you can discuss them um, among yourselves. But I put these questions out there to get your interest and to get you see how betrayed we all are. I cannot say you, because I'm as betrayed as you all. I mean, as, as we all. I'm, I'm no better. I'm, I'm not better than any man who listens to this video or, or, or makes other videos or whatever. I can only point out the facts. They are called fascists and I can think of no reason for them to be there other than to declare the fascistic nature of American Republican democracy, Tapasosi states in this book. Okay, this ends the reading of the first chapter of Rulers of Evil. I will go on and quote something else that comes from page 73 and page 74. Also very interesting, but of course we jump a little bit ahead in the book right now. Continue reading. During its four centuries of existence, the Jesuit educational theatrical enterprise had, has produced a proud, poised and imaginative graduate. He or she is enlightened by the Medici Library's humanities, facile in worldly matters, moved by theatrically, theatrically, sorry, <laughs> that's uh, uh, quite a disturbing word for me, theatricality, and indifferent toward holy scripture. Producing Jesuit <coughs> Jesuitic graduates has become the aim of modern public education, despite the heavy price of ignoring scripture which, as Luther warned, and the Columbine murders attest, has indeed turned the public schools into widened gates of hell. Um, this little insert here, what Luther warned from, that is a quote from Luther that um, is later appeared uh, in the book, and uh, we will read that later, but when you go to page 73, 74, something there around, <coughs> you will find that. Um, Luther was a very wise man and he wrote that in 1520, you know, so that's quite a difference between to what we have today. So I'm going to continue reading right now. I was interrupted a little bit, so um, uh, continue reading. Jesuit theater and the spiritual exercises whose original purpose was to bring human understanding into papal subservience through esoteric emotional experiences have evolved to the full panoply of contemporary social communication. The great objective of, of obscuring scripture has operated to discourage the formal study of the basics of which the Bible is the cornerstone literature, science and history. Well, here actually is something else to say. Um, that's a point that A.J. Wiley made um, at the time of the Reformation about the conscience and what is scripture. I mean, uh, John Wycliffe, first of all, John Wycliffe said, quote, the Bible is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And when you're obscuring scripture, then you take away the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. 
and um, the quote that I wanted to read actually from um, J. A. Wiley, James Atkin Wiley, from his book Rome and Civil Liberty, was God alone is Lord of the conscience, and that was the truth that set Europe free. That thought, that reformation, that was what set the minds of the European people free at that time, free from the yoke of Rome. So, the Jesuits have a great objective of obscuring scripture. And where that leads to, well, everybody can see when they look into their education system today. Okay? Here follows a quote now from John Daniel. John Daniel is the author of the book The Grand Design Exposed, from page 84. Quote, Too many. History might be dry and boring. Yet, if we have a burning desire to understand what is truth, then history becomes vibrant and alive. History sheds light on our present world and also gives understanding for the future. It is through history that we find our roots and has become the reason and object of why much of our history today has been truly censored, so that our roots will be purposely obscured." End quote. Now think about the almost 200 years between 1492 and 1776, the founding of the United States. What do you know about that history there in between? What do you really know about <coughs> the England colonies in that time and how politics were made at that time and by whom they were made at that time? I will follow with a quote from the Bible, of course that is uh, the King James Version. I do never quote another version except when I tell you and the reason why I would do that, because it's it twisted. But the King James Version is the really <coughs> true and one preserved word of God in the English language today. And in 1 Timothy 6 verse 20 we read, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so called." End quote. Research by the National Association of Scholars, or the NAS, of US News and World Report's annual listing of America's best colleges, including both private and public, disclosed startling figures. In 1914, nearly all of these institutions had required courses in English composition. By 1964, the figure was 86%. In 1996, that is the time that Tapa Saucy wrote this, wrote this book, 36%. In 1914, 82% of the best colleges and universities had traditional mathematics requirements. More than 70% of the institutions required at least one course in, that, in the natural sciences. That figure fell to 34% in 1996. Literature courses were required at 75% of the institutions in 1914 and at 50% in 1939 and 1964. Today, none of these best institutions has a literature requirement. Most colleges today are turning out graduates who have studied little or no history. Now, pay attention. In 1914, 90% of America's elite colleges required history. In 1939 and 1964, more than 50% did. By 1996, only one of the 50 best, best schools offered a required history course. You can say that religious freedom does not mean that you cannot teach about the history of religion, right? The day is approaching, perhaps when the only historians will be amateurs who study history as self-help, who examine the past in order to make sense of the present and not to be caught unprepared by the future." End quote from the book from Tapa Saucy. This is a very profound little article that he wrote in there, a little paragraph that he wrote in there. Now think about it. He mentions 1914, 90% of America's elite colleges required history. In 1939 and 1964, more than 50% did, but that's already less than 90%, right? By 1996, only one of the 50 best schools offered a required history course. 
Now, why am I pounding on this? When you count the years between 1914, when 90% of the colleges required history, and 1939, you come back to 25 years. When you add another 25 years, you come to 1964. Still then, it was about 50% of the schools that required a history course. <coughs> My point being, we have two times a time frame of 25 years. And that is exactly the time that is counted for as a generation. So, that means that from one generation to another, you have the loss of almost the loss of almost 50% of teaching history in the schools now what do you think these people are taught then not history and because they are not taught history they cannot make any sense of the present and they surely will have problems to make any sense of the future so the problem what i'm going to tell you is that when you jump from generation to generation and you cut down history courses, you will leave the people uneducated. Well, of course, you educate them, uh, what I like to call it, they in, you indoctrinate them, but you do not educate them. And this goes on from generation to generation to generation. Now think about it, 1914, he starts, that was 90%, now we have 2015. How many is that today in comparison? What are the people actually learning about their history? And the history of a nation is its culture. The history of a nation is its, identi uh, it's its identity. So the people lose their identity of their own history. And they will be, of course, caught unprepared by the future because of this teaching from generation to generation. There was, I don't know when, a quote that I read from someone who said, the liberties that one generation fought for have to be preserved and fought to be uh, uh, and, and fought for again in the next generation. You know, that means that every generation, again and again, over and over again, has to fight for its liberty, and this didn't happen for the last 150 or even more years. Not there in the United States, not over here in Europe, and probably not in any other country because the whole education system has been taken over by the Jesuits. And they don't want you to know the real history. Because when you know the real history, you will also see things repeating themselves. Look what is happening in Baltimore today, and what happened a little bit earlier in Ferguson, and what happened all over the world. That's nothing new. It's only new for you guys in America over there, but it's nothing new. And you will be caught unprepared when you don't study history. Okay, we have here another quote from John Daniel's book, The Grand Design Exposed, from page 84. Um, too many history... Uh, no, no, uh, I, I read that already. So, we continue on and have to say, who controls the past? And how can you control the past? When you control the present. You control the past by changing the past to your means. So who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Now who said that? George Orwell. You probably know him from books like 1984, Animal Farm, and then you say, oh, that could never happen over here. Well, let me tell you one thing. I'm German and it happened over there. It can happen everywhere. But ask yourself, who controlled the Dark Ages? Who controls the present? Hey, the first question answers the second question. And here follows a quote from Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, a book written by Samuel Morse, you know, the inventor of the Morse Code, 1835. Quote, the food of popery is ignorance. Ignorance is the mother of papal devotion. Ignorance is the legitimate prey of popery. Ignorance is the condition of being uneducated, unaware or uninformed. End quote. America's understanding has been systematically bent to the will of the church militant. 
while the intellectual means for sensing the capture have been disconnected. Most of the content of modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage or web, is state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiorum. Now, I will not go any deeper into uh, studio uh, ratio studiorum, uh, except for a little explanation that comes here from the Book of Rules of Evil, because time is almost up. I wanted to uh, put this video up for 45 minutes, so this will be the last thing that I'll be reading here. Now, this comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Remember, the Catholic Encyclopedia. The term ratio studiorum is commonly used to designate the educational system of the Jesuits. It is an abbreviation of the official title, quote, Ratio Atque Institutio Studiorum Societatis Jesu, meaning Method and System of the Studies of the Society of Jesus. And this embraces all modern media, television, radio, print, film, stage or web. It's state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiorum, method and system of the studies of the Society of Jesus. I do not think that I have to read any more to make you aware of the role of the Jesuits in the daily political life, not only over there in the United States of America, but all over the world. Concerning the United States of America, you have to understand that when you find out that these Jesuits, this Society of Jesus, through people like John, Daniel and Charles Carroll, founded the United States of America, then you have to ask yourself, am I really living in a protestant country? Am I really living in a free country? Or am I living under canon law, the law of the Roman Catholic Church? And if I am living under these laws, what are my rights? Or do I have any rights anyway? So, please, ask yourself these questions, do your own studies, go down to the web and download the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapasosi. I will be reading the whole book starting within a few days or a few weeks, for sure. I'm not sure right now because, you know, I have so much on my mind uh, doing uh, radio broadcasts with Walt Stickel. We went into um, the global Vatican Jesuit uh, conspiracy and um, this is a book that we have to do reading and analyzing. It's more than a hundred pages right now. We did a lot of editing on that yesterday evening and um, tonight even in, uh, in about an hour I'm going on another uh, broadcast with him on uh, Mystery Babylon Block Talk Radio um, that we are doing and uh, you can follow these if you want to. Time is running out for us to see where we stand and to see the deception that is put all around us from cradle to grave. So, I hope you liked my reading of the Rulers of Evil, in this case, teaser called. I hope you watch out for more, and then I will be very happy to provide you more, doing the whole reading of the book. And uh, for the rest, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching to the video. You may copy this video to your own YouTube channel. You can... Um, you can uh, share it on Facebook or whatever social media that you are in. I'm not in those things, but anyway, I advise you to, if you are, to do that, to get the word out and discuss it with your friends and with your family and see what world you are really living in. Open your eyes because time is running out. So, again, thank you very much for listening and viewing the video. Until the next time, God bless you all. Bye-bye.